are in for a treat tonight. One of the stars in the film you're going to see is none other than our own service manager, Roy. Ah, uh, never mind the fanfare, Tech. I was just used as a guinea pig. Actually, this film was made at the Detroit Training Center when I was there getting the dope on the new models. They just asked me to make like a student. Incidentally, a chassis instead of a complete car was used. That made it easier to photograph front suspension points because all the sheet metal was out of the way. You'll also notice that weights were added to make up for the missing body. Front end readings, therefore, would be the same as those for a complete car. We can skip the first few pictures and get right into the checking operations. Turn off the light, will you, Pete? Before we do any checking, I want to stress the importance of being careful when taking gauge readings. Be sure they're according to specifications, no guesswork. Why all the emphasis on accuracy? Well, with today's heavier cars, failing to follow specifications can affect braking, handling, riding comfort, and tire life. The first point to check is front suspension height, isn't it? You said it, Tech. Front suspension height must be correct before you even try to check or adjust front wheel alignment. Oh, then you're really serious about measuring suspension height with the car empty and with a full tank of gas. Right. But remember that you can always add weight to the luggage compartment to make up for any lack of gas in the tank. Now, in addition, make sure wheel bearings are properly adjusted. Inspect the suspension for looseness, wear, or damage. All tires should be inflated to specified pressure, and the car must be level. In addition, suspension and spring should be at normal rest. So, bounce the car a half dozen times by pushing down at the center of the front bumper. Release the bumper on a downstroke. Repeat that on the rear bumper. Same number of strokes. Use this front suspension level and height gauge, C3608, to measure difference in height between the lower ball joint and the underside of the lower control arm bushing. Say, I like this gauge more every time I use it. Reading the difference in height directly without having to figure it out is what appeals to me. Uh, the gauge should read two and one-eighth inches on standard passenger cars and two and one-half inches on all Suburbans and on cars with heavy-duty front springs plus or minus one-eighth of an inch. If either side doesn't meet those specifications or there's more than one-eighth inch difference between the two sides, you'll have to adjust the torsion bars. I understand. I just tighten or loosen the adjusting bolt at the torsion bar anchor and it's also necessary to adjust both sides, even though only one side is off. That's right. When you adjust one side, it affects the other. So you have to adjust both. Watch the measuring pins on the height gauge as you adjust the anchor bolts. They'll tell you exactly when you're within specifications. That's right, Roy. But always recheck after making the adjustments. Bounce the car again, front and rear, and take new readings to be sure you're right. Then when the front end is level, you're ready to check caster and camber. Before you get into that, Quinn, does the new rear air spring setup affect the adjustment of the front end? Oh, it certainly does. Front end height specifications are different. One and seven-eighths inches for all cars except the Imperial, and two and one-eighths on the Imperial. Rear height also affects caster angle. So, on a car with air spring rear suspension, adjust front height first then the rear. Go back and recheck the front before you try to adjust caster or camber. Oh, -ho, something new. I'll be sure to tell the boys about that when I get back. Good. Now, I think you know how this new front suspension is made, but let's review the caster camber adjusting setup before we start our adjustments. Each upper control arm support bracket has a cam retainer welded to its outer face. Horizontal slots are provided for the adjusting bolt movement. Integral cams are welded under the head of each bolt. Matching removable cams are located on a flat at the threaded end. Uh, I understand the construction. Okay. Now, turning both front and rear adjusting bolts an equal amount in the same direction moves the upper control arm in or out, increasing or decreasing camber. By turning each bolt an equal amount in opposite directions, you move the ball joint end of the arm fore or aft, 
to increase or decrease caster. All clear so far, Quinn. Ready to take readings now? All ready. These wheels have been set wrong because I wanted you to have to make an adjustment. So go ahead and take your camber reading. Are we still working to the same camber limits? Positive one quarter to negative one quarter with zero preferred? That's right. What do you read? Camber is positive one half degree on the right wheel. Okay. Now turn either the front or the rear adjusting bolt until you get zero camber. Let's see. I turn the bolt to bring the top of the wheel inward until the scale reads zero. Got it. Okay. Tighten the lock nut to hold that adjustment and take the caster reading. Caster is positive two degrees. Boy, you really did foul us up. <laughs> of course. Now, here's where I introduce you to a chart that's going to help you do this job. There are at least two other charts that will show you what adjustments to make to bring this wheel back to specifications, but I like this one. If you do what it says, you'll not only correct caster, but you'll also keep camber within limits. Now, here's how to use the chart. You're working on the right wheel, and you've set camber at zero, and the job has power steering. Caster reading is positive two degrees. For a caster of positive two degrees, the chart says to adjust the front bolt to get a camber reading of negative one quarter degree. Now, uh, let's do it. All right. Negative one quarter. I've got it. And I'll tighten the lock nut to hold it. Okay. Then the chart says to adjust the rear bolt until the camber reading is zero. Zero? Okay, zero it is. And the lock nut is tightened. Good enough. Now, camber is zero degrees, which is what you wanted for your final setting. Check the caster reading to be sure it, too, is within specifications. It is, Quinn. We're within specifications for both angles now. Very good. So you're ready to tighten those adjusting bolt lock nuts to 65 foot-pounds torque. Hold the bolts while tightening the nuts so the cams won't turn. Then go back and recheck your angles to be sure they didn't change during the tightening. Follow the same procedure for the left wheel, I suppose. Yes, exactly the same. Follow the chart, and you can't go wrong. Say, how about taking a break while someone turns the record over? Good idea. Let's do it. There are a couple of things to look out for when you're adjusting caster, Roy. On manual steering cars, remember, specifications call for negative caster. So, in these cases, always be sure to find the caster reading along the line of the chart that's headed manual steering cars. In other words, read the chart right, huh? That's for sure. And when you use the caster camber correction chart, always adjust the front bolt first. Then make your final adjustment at the rear bolt. And here's another tip. On most models, it's impossible to put a torque wrench on the adjusting bolt nuts, so you'll have to use the C3005 or C524 torque wrench and this new C3675 ratchet tool. With that combination, a torque reading of 45 foot-pounds on the wrench will equal the specified 65 foot-pounds at the nut. On some Chryslers, with many accessories, you'll have to use the shorter C3696 ratchet tool. Now, in this case, you tighten the lock nut to a torque reading of 55 foot-pounds to get 65 foot-pounds at the nut. And don't over-tighten those lock nuts. That can damage the ratchet tool as well as the upper control arm brackets. All right, Tech, I'll watch that. Good, Roy. Now, toe-in is still adjusted the same way and to one-eighth inch. Be sure the steering wheel is centered, then see that the tie rod clamp bolts are on the underside before you tighten them. Well, that about covers the big changes on front-end suspension adjusting procedures. Let's take a look at the new rear suspension air springs. There's some important do's and don'ts you ought to keep in mind. First of all, the air springs support about 300 pounds of the total weight on the rear axle when the car is empty. As the load in the car increases, either from passengers or luggage, the additional weight is carried by the air springs. That's why the car height doesn't change much with increased load. Air pressure changes required because of changes in load are automatically controlled by a bleed feed type of height control valve. This valve is attached to the low pressure tank mounted on the frame. 
The actuating arm of the valve is connected to the rear axle by means of a flexible rubber link. Now, as you can see, the rear height of the car is kept almost constant. When the load is increased and the body tends to settle, the valve lets air enter the springs to restore the desired height. When the load is removed and the body tends to rise, the valve lets air bleed from the springs to let the body return to its normal height. Yeah, Roy, and remember, you gotta give that height control valve time to do its job. The rate of air bleed and feed is purposely slowed down, and your customers should be told about it. Okay, I understand. How much time does the valve take to react to a change of load? No, oh, about two to three minutes, Roy. The valve doesn't respond immediately. That keeps it from trying to compensate for momentary changes in car height due to normal bumps and dips in the road. I see. And it makes sense. Right. Now, in general, then, the two air springs and low-pressure tank act as one single spring of large volume. Pressure in both air springs is always equal. I've got a question. Suppose the customer tosses all his gear and heavy luggage on one side of the trunk or rear seat. What happens? This air spring system isn't intended to level out severe loads on one side. It just keeps the rear end level with the front. Tell Roy what happens if the car is overloaded, Quinn. An air sprung car will take a load equal to the weight of nine average sized people, about 12 to 1500 pounds maximum. Overloading won't wreck the system, though. It triggers a pop-off feature in the control valve that'll slowly settle the body and warn of the overload. And it won't come up to normal height until the overload is relieved. Pretty neat. A built-in safety feature. Now, any tips on maintenance? One important thing to do is to drain the moisture that collects in the high-pressure tank every month, Roy. Just to press this tire-type valve, and that's all there's to it. Let me add one caution, Roy. Never remove that valve to release pressure. Just push it in like you bleed a tire. Always do that before you service the lines or pressure units. Okay, I'll remember that. Anything else? Yeah. About every 5,000 miles, check the air compressor intake filter felt and replace it if it's dirty. Better explain how to check rear suspension height, Quinn, so Roy will know whether the height control valve is doing its job. Will do, Tech. The height control valve adjusts pressure in the air springs to maintain an almost constant height, regardless of load. The valve can be adjusted, if necessary, to keep that height within specifications. To check the height, be sure the car is level, tires properly inflated, and the gas tank full. Add 150 to 200 pounds in the center of the luggage compartment. Then run the engine at about 2,000 RPM for five minutes to be sure the suspension is up to normal pressure. Use this C3670 gauge to measure the distance from the axle housing to the dimple in the bumper strap on the frame on each side. Both sides should measure the same within one half inch. I've got four and three quarters on the left and five inches on the right. That's within one half inch, so it's okay, huh? Right. Now, since the control valve is in the center between the wheels, the height at that point would be the average of the two measurements, or four and seven-eighths inches. You follow that? Still with you, Quinn. Okay. Now we'll check unloaded height. So remove the weight from the luggage compartment, and remember to wait about three minutes because of the restricted air supply in the control valve, then we'll measure unloaded height. Ah. Now we have five inches on the left side and five and a quarter on the right. Still within the half inch tolerance, so we're okay on unloaded height too, huh? Yes, as far as side to side is concerned. The average unloaded height then is five and one eighth inches. Now, we want the average between loaded and unloaded heights to see how the control valve is adjusted. The average between four and seven eighths and five and one eighth is exactly five inches. Uh, what do specifications call for? Four and three quarters, plus or minus an eighth, on all but imperial. Four and three eighths with the same tolerance for imperials. Our average of five inches is too high, then. That means we'll have to adjust the valve. Yeah. Loosen both valve mounting nuts slightly so the valve can be moved. 
then adjust the control valve cam to rotate the valve body in a clockwise direction. This will make the valve reduce the controlled height. Then hold the cam while you tighten both mounting nuts to exactly 100 inch pounds. Don't get them any tighter. 100 inch pounds. Okay, I'll watch it. What tolerance is allowed between the average loaded and unloaded figures? Only a half inch on a new car, Roy, but up to three quarters of an inch after the car has been in service for a while. If the valve won't control the average height within those limits, there's too much lost motion in the valve and it'll have to be replaced. I see. And I suppose after you adjust this valve, you have to go through the complete loaded and unloaded checks again to see if the valve is adjusted right. That you do, my friend. Now, another important thing to test is compressor output. To do this, you first have to discharge the air. Next, install this adapter tool between the air line and check valve. In the adapter, install this C3293 air pressure gauge and start the engine. Run the engine at about 2,000 RPM and check gauge pressure. What should pressure be, Quinn? 220 pounds, plus or minus 20 pounds. If you don't get that, it calls for some troubleshooting. For example, a check valve might be plugged, or the drive belt might be slipping. If these are okay, you'll have to look into the compressor itself, and that's another story. To find leaks in the system, do what your gas man does when he's tracing leaks. Brush liquid soap over all seams, joints, and connections. Drain valve, air springs and seats, and the height control valve mounting. Then, when the engine runs and the system's full of air, any that gets out will form a bubble at the escape point. That's the idea, Tech. You'll find all the things to check are listed in this reference book, along with other service tips you'll find spelled out. Study it when you have some spare time. I sure will, Quinn. That book's going to be a lifesaver. Well, there's the end of my acting career. It was fun, and I sure learned a lot about suspension service while I was at it. That was a mighty clear explanation, Roy. What now? Well, I'd like to put this car on our front-end equipment and go through the caster camber adjustment for the fellas, just as I did in the film. boy. Then everybody will know it as well as they should. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll run along. But I'll be with you again next month.